Hello, everyone. This is Keith Stone with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and we're here for another Cosmos Society open house. Um, our guest today is Maria Zanthu, who is one of our own, and she's going to talk with us about Chalkidic regionality. Um, and um, Maria, have I asked you my musical question, as Greg likes to say, about uh, your inspiration for classical studies? Uh, yes, uh, I'm sorry, I remember, I you know, it's uh, it's okay. It, it's always good to repeat it. Um, uh, I've been taught uh, Iliad and Odyssey when I was uh, quite young at school, at elementary school. This is when I came across uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, I think that the person who inspired me to look into these poems uh, is uh, was my grandfather, who actually was literally the singer of tales because he used to um, narrate the Odyssey uh, orally, although he was, um, in a way, he went just up to third year uh, of elementary school. Uh, then uh, I, I was taught Greek and uh, Latin at school, and I was initiated into classical scholarship and classical philology during my um, university studies and uh, move along with uh, my PhD and then my research as a full academic scholar. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I should say that you are a CHS fellow um, and you are, oh, please forgive me, um, you're at Leeds. Now, now, now I'm, I'm, I'm at, CH, at the Harvard CHS and the Hellenic Open University. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Please begin. Thank you for having me. Um, last time, Paul Cartledge uh, took us to Sparta. And in this open, uh, CHS Open House, I would like to invite you to a different travel. And this time, our travel is in northern Greece, where much of the Peloponnesian War was fought. Today, uh, what uh, I'm going to do, what we're going to discuss, is to try to define the term Halkidiki and Halkidik, which is really controversial, both geographically and ethically. Uh, another uh, goal is to analyze the creation of what we may call Halkidic epihoric identity. And also, uh, we will discuss the emergence of Olynthos and what we call the Halkidic League or Halkidic Federation, if you ever heard of it, in the larger framework of geography and epihoric identities. So when trying to define the term Halkidic and Halkidic, we are in dire straits as we should confront the skilla of death of early sources in the form of literary evidence, coins, and inscriptions, and archaeological find findings, and the Charybdis of anachronism, which entails that a collective Greek identity be attributed to the cities of the area due to the overwhelming abundance of evidence from classical and later Greek authors who impose their contemporary, if not revisionistic, view on explaining the connection between origin, geography, and contemporary identity. Most ancient literary and epigraphic sources dated in the 5th century BCE attest the Athenian point of view that Chalcidiki was considered as geographically belonging to Thrace, if not being Thrace itself. The variants that Thucydides cites, like Apothrakes Foros or Thrakios Foros, are at their best suggestive of Halkidiki belonging to Thrace, whereas one may claim that the third variant, Epithrakes Foros, also attested in the Athenian tribute list, the famous ATL, implies the conception of Halkidiki not as, not as part of Thrace, but as a separate region between Macedon and Thrace. In 5th century BC literary sources, the prepositional phrase epithrakes, used in the variant formula Halkidais hoi epithrakes or hoi epithrakes Halkidais, refers to the Halkidians. However, other similarly coined formula, like Halkidais hoi prostethrake, with dative, 
or Halki Days or Hoi and Thrake, also uh, with date with N and dative, are retrospectively used by later authors. I think that this formula attempt to impose an external uniformity based on a blurring of geographical identification and an emphasis on a collective identity with vaguely epichoric overtones. One also may suppose that the reference to Thrace implies the local population mainly consisted of Thracian tribes that initially inhabited the area and survived until the 5th century BCE at the prong of Acti, nowadays known as Hagion Oros. As promised, my lecture today will draw attention to different aspects of forging an epichoric identity and of a fascinating interregional interepichoric relation which was developed among Olynthos, the most prominent city of the Botiki area. This is where the area uh, um, that uh, uh, how this area was called. And other major cities and smaller settlements situated along the coastline of Toroneus Gulf. Before moving further on, allow me to present you with some insight as regards what we may call the Wuzen Soros in geographically defining two regions of Halkidic hinterland and peninsula, the Botiki on one hand and the Halkidiki on the other. In antiquity, even in 5th century BCE, Halkidic peninsula as a geographical region did not fit into one collective name. Um, Herodotus provides us with the earliest detailed description of the peninsula from east to west. And this is the map that you see uh, on your screen. And we will move from uh, right to left, okay? So, um, on your right uh, hand is the easternmost prong, which is called the Acti prong. And um, then is the Singitikos Kolpos, the Singitikos Gulf. Uh, then the middle prong is the Th is Sithonia. Then the, comes the Toroneus Gulf, and then uh, the westernmost or the prong on your left side is what we nowadays call Palene and used to be called Flegra. So Herodotus provides us with the earliest detailed description of the peninsula from west, from east to west, uh, as he follows Xerxes' advance in northern Greece. And he refers to the isthmus of Athos. Uh, this is, again, where the Acanthos is situated, with a number of uh, polis. This is handout number four. Now, between Athos and the next peninsula, this is Cetonia. There is an anonymous bay, again, Singitikos, according to uh, Strabo, number five in your handout, and he reports the existence of four polis on it. And I refer to number six uh, of your handout. After that comes Cetonia, I referred to it earlier, in which we also come across some polis, and then he moves on to Palini, formerly known as Flegri, and mentions eight polis which were on it. Herodotus moves northwest to the western coast of the peninsula, which he calls Kori Krosai, with no less than seven polis. This is number seven of the handout. And after the polis of Aenea comes the Thermaic Gulf. The Thermaic Gulf is this, this large portion that you see on, on your map on your left side. Uh, you can see uh, on the upper side of your map the word Therme, and this is where the, the Thermaeus Therme, Therme, Gulf is. And finally, he calls the interior region the northern uh, part of the peninsula, Ge Mygdonaia. It is interesting that Herodotus does not provide its audience or readers with a name for the eastern coast for, or for the hinterland of the Chalcidic Peninsula. However, he refers to the Chalcidians in the context I mentioned earlier, namely the destruction of Olynthos by the Persians and their handing over the city to the Chalcidians and Critobulus of Torone. 
In that sense, we may safely conclude that Herodotus considers Torone as a Chalcidic town. And in the same context, Herodotus, another most important contribution is the name of Sithonia. It is with this suggestion that I would like to include another point in my discussion. The Cities provides us with two new entries in this geographical puzzle or quiz. The names of two regions, Botike and Chalkidiki, although he conspicuously avoids naming the Middle Peninsula, which his predecessor had already offered. I will not enter into a detailed discussion of the various Thessalian passages, you have them on your handout, but one pattern that we can discern is that the point of convergence between the two historiographers is the following. As I mentioned earlier, Herodotus considers Torone a Chalcidic city, naming, namely belonging to the Chalcidians. In your handout number 8, the Thessalians also calls Torone Chalcidian. At any rate, if one examines all Thucydidean passages relevant to the region, one could safely conclude that the term Chalkidiki gradually replaced the term Sithonia and was ultimately used to denote all or most of Sithonia by late 5th century BCE. Now, this substitution may also point towards a homogenized a homogenized perception of the region and the attempt for an imposition of a collective identification, but I would ask you from using the term identity for the time being. So far, I offered you a general view on the geographical definition of Sithonia and Chalkidiki and how the latter eventually substituted the former. I would like now to offer you some background information regarding the vexed matter of the Botiki region. This is the region surrounding Olynthus and the origin of its inhabitants. And as a spoiler alert, I have to warn you that I have not reached into definitive conclusions in the likes of Nicholas Hammond or Miltiades Hadzopoulos, but I would like to use some of their conclusions towards my working uh, argument. So Botiki is the region located south of Crusades on the western coast of the main body of Halkidiki. Olynthos, uh, this is the next uh, slide, uh, was the largest um, and most important city of Botiki. Uh, if you see uh, where Mekberna is, if you go a little further north, you could see this white spot. This is Olynthos. Um, so Olynthos was the largest and most important city of Botiki. It was considered to be originally a Botian city. And from 432 BC onwards, it became the center of the Chalkidic League or Federation. The city occupied two hills and we will speak about them later on, the southern, where the archaic city of the Botian was situated, and the northern, where the city of the Chalcidians was built in 432. It was first mentioned by Hecateus, uh, and in the context, this is number one in your handout, and in the context of Xerxes' campaign, this is handout number two. Strabus's characterization, this is handout number three, of Mekuberna, and this is uh, Olynthos's Epineion, uh, as Epineion Olynthus was further validated by underwater survey, which attested Strabus' view that the settlement functioned as the harbor town of Olynthos. However, it should be noted that according to Herodotus, this is handout again, um, I think I marked it as number one, but it is further down. After their defeat in 479 BCE, the Persians, whose dependency Olympus was, feared that the city would revolt and consequently was conquered. It was conquered by Artabazos, Xerxes' uh, general, subjected to an anthropodismos and handed over to the people of Toroni and the Chalcidians. One important question is whom the inhabitants of this region were. The identity of the inhabitants of, Vot of Votike, Botike was and remains a vexed matter. Any historian of Botian identity comes face to face with the two monsters I mentioned earlier. Although research is doomed 
to come to a deadlock, it is worth it to revisit the earliest literary source on the categorization of Botians, namely Herodotus number nine. Uh, where, uh, and I don't believe that what is at stake in this passage is to make out whether Botians are categorized as Greeks or as barbarians. Their placement between the barbarian tribe of Eordoi and a rather curious phrase, Tohal Kidikon Genos, which presumably denotes a mixed product of Greek settlers in Chalkidiki and natives, may allude to their mixed origin, but it certainly implies the region they inhabited. I think that one key for understanding uh, is the order of the ethnic epithets in the list, which may well correspond to the order of the regions where these tribes dwell. And in that sense, I'm more inclined to believe that Herodotus lays emphasis on this mixed identity of Halkidic Genos as the outcome of the contact between natives and settlers. Although the, the inclusion of Achaeans in this list may bring the Greek factor into play, this inclusion could not undermine the epichoric identity of the list. If number 9 of your, hand, of your handout is combined with number 10 of your handout, um, where Herodotus enumerates seven Thracian tribes, six of whom were added to the Persian forces uh, between Doriscus and Strimon, and others added between Strimon and Acanthos, then this list may be considered as a kind of coda to number 12 of your handout, which links the systematic presentation of Thracian tribes with the tribes in Macedon, Thessaly, Theotis, and neighboring regions. In the light of this passage, I also read Herodotus' early statement that Olynthos was a polis Hellenis in 7th book 122 as anachronistic because Herodotus attempt to explain that Olynthus was a Botian polis in the time of Atrabazos's destruction in 478 BCE may probably allude to the three stages of development of Olynthus's development which Olynthus appeared to have undergone before the Peloponnesian war so the first was a primitive settlement, the next was a Botian, and then a Halkidic in two degrees. Later authors such as Strabo and Plutarch supported the Greek origin of Botians. Strabo cited mythological material about some Cretans having emigrated to Sicily. A group of them, according to Strabo, left Sicily to arrive in Macedon with no clear indication of their motives, where they called themselves Botians, normally after their leader named Boton. This is number 13 of your handout. Strabo's information is confirmed by Thucydides. This, this is handout number 14, who presents the colonization of Gela in Sicily as a joint venture of the Rhodians and the Cretans. I'm more inclined to follow Hammond's suggestion that the Botians were originally Minoans on the basis of, of archaeological finds. He also gives a more insightful and complex explanation of how the Botians gradually forged a Greek epichoric identity by starting as non-Greek speaking people upon their arrival to the land, uh, later to be named Botike. Hadzopoulos also puts forth the process of gradual Hellenization. The sources which offer us some reliable information about the origin of Botians are limited and they include literary sources, coins, and inscriptions. The inscriptions are few and written in Greek. For example, the boundary stone dated late 5th or early 4th century BC found uh, in Vromosita, this is handout number 14, 15. The alliance between Athenians and Botians concluded around 422. The Athenian tribute lists and the, uh, the alliance between Amintas, the King Amintas, and Chalcidians around 393, mainly point towards the documentation of the relations with Athens and the Macedonian Kingdom. In the case of the treaty between 
the Athenians of the Botians, it may be concluded from the text of the treaty that Botians had their own copies of the inscription. However, it is highly debatable whether these copies were inscribed in Greek. Now, how all this information that I told you relates to the Halkidian Epichoric identities. A non-Greek origin of the Botians, together with the possibility that the Halkidians in Sithonia were a mixture of native people and colonies, gives rise to a mixed, if not fluid, Epichoric identity, which may account for the tumultuous history of this region. This scenario is very further corroborated if we consider that the Sithones, counted by Strabo as a group of Thracians, uh, the Edones in Thrace, may have been the original inhabitants of Sithonia and its hinterland, driven back by Halkidians from Euboea colonizing the region. Olynthos, Mecuberna, Sarmilia, Gale, and Toroni along with Hagios Giannis and Castrinikiti, which uh, with traces of settlement dating to the 7th century BCE, created a unique uh, micro-region as they formed a network of successive coastal urban clusters and settlements. Two cities, Olythos and Sarmilia, were located between hinterland and coastline, and three others, Mecuberna, Gale and Toroni, are located on the coastline. Mecuberna is located about 20 stadia east of Olynthos. And I'm giving you this particular uh, different view of Toroneus Gulf just to see. Uh, you can see Olynthos, the Greek word Olynthos, which is in the hinterland. And Mecuberna is where Calives Polygiru um, is. So, um, it was first mentioned in Hecateus, this is number 16 of your handout, and in the context of Xerxes' campaign. Strabos, this is number 17 um, um, of your handout, characterization of Mecuberna as an Epinanian Olenthu, though feeble as it may seem, was further corroborated uh, by underwater survey, which attested Strabo's views that the settlement functioned as the harbor town of Olenthus. And here you can see uh, a picture from Milonas' excavations at Mecuberna, uh, from by Johns Hopkins University back in 1934, and I give you this is uh, where Mecuberna is situated, and you can see, uh, and I added the geographical um, uh, urban clusters you can see from uh, Mecuberna. What you see uh, when you are uh, in Mecuberna. Um, the coastal early settlement of Mecuberna may also have been used as a station during a sea travel. That's why I added the different polis. I added Toroni, I added Galepsos, and also uh, I noted Sinus Sermilicus and Sinus Toroneus. The name of Mecuberna seems to be pre-Hellenic. And as, a Greek, as the Greek archaeologist Michalis Tiverios suggests, that it cannot have been founded as a Greek uh, colony, as Olynthos indeed was not. So he offers the following uh, hypothesis. When they settled in the area in the 7th century BCE, the Botians probably did not drive out the local people, but rather settled down alongside them. Although at some point the significance of Mecuberna as a port of Olynthos is downplayed by Chart, and here you can see on this slide how Mecuberna, this, is, uh, this picture is taken from uh, Olynthos. Uh, by the way, the person you can see is my husband taking uh, a picture from, <laughs> from, uh, from another point of view. Here we are on the archaeological site of Olenthos, and what you see in the distance is Mecuberna and the Toroneus Gulf. Um, so Mecuberna is downplayed by Chant in preference to that of uh, Potidea, and this appreciation reflects 4th century BCE Olynthian politics. And 446 BCE is the terminus post when, when Mecuberna is recorded in the Athenian tribute list. 
In 450 BCE, it Mecuberna revolted against Athens, was dissolved as a polis and lost its population to the Anoikismos of Olynthos. And the Anoikismos of Olynthos led to the famous uh, Olynthos uh, city, the creation of Olynthos city, um, the archaeological site of which you see uh, right now. Uh, so in 42, it Mecuberna uh, revolted against Athens, was revolted, uh, was dissolved as a police and lost its population to the Nanoikismos of Olynthos, but it was reconquered before 425 BCE. In 421 BC, the Peace of Nicaea established the independence of Mycibana, but Olynthos seized it in the following winter. It was closely related to Olynthos and served as its port until its final conquest by Philip II in 349. Moreover, the existence of Mycibana gained significance if related to a cemetery which consists of a set of 59 tombs found in 1977. One of the archaeologists, Katerina Romniopoulou, based on the evidence from the pot church, jar burials, and the grave goods found in them, and you can see a sample of the archaeological finds uh, which were dug uh, in this uh, cemetery, dates uh, the cemetery and the settlement in Hagios Yanis. You can see the wonderful Cotule and Skifoi found in them. In the end of 8th, beginning of 7th century BC until the beginning of 5th century. And here is, on this slide, you can see uh, with big letters where uh, the cemetery is situated, its exact site. Romniopoulou puts forth the compelling hypothesis that the Hagios Gannis three settlement was a coastal point of coexistence between the native people of Sithonia, possibly of Thracian origin, and the Euboean migrants. Leaving aside the Euboean hypothesis, it is more significant to acknowledge an already existing native population in Sithonia. Romniopoulou also conjectures that the settlement was abandoned due, the, due to the Anoikismos of Olynthos. The Hagios Giannis Castri Cemetery and Settlement and the coastal early settlement of Mecuberna may also point towards Robin Osborne's theory and also Irad uh, Malkin's Big Bang theory of Greek expansion in the Mediterranean on early Greek apoikismos as a private venture which lacked institutional patronage and central planning but relied on the opportunistic motivation of adventurers who became the pioneers of the Greek apoikismos. So these soldiers of fortunes being embarked on the early private enterprises of the late geometric and early archaic period, which ended up with the settlement of numerous people of Greek origin in Italian peninsula, Sicily, Macedonia, Thrace, and the Halkyric coastline at a time where there was no clear line between piracy and marine uh, trade. Um, before I move at this uh, point, I would like to add some thoughts on sustainability and subsistence in Sithonia and Halkidic coastline as regards the formation of an epichoric identity. Um, here you, you're, you may be able to watch uh, a video that we took uh, from Olynthos. Here you can see the drone is flying over the archaeological site of Olynthos and the nearby area. It approaches the two hills where Olynthos uh, was built. Now it turns uh, northwest, north, northeast, and uh, south to southeast. And this is where Tornes Gulf is and um, uh, where the um, Potidea, the final uh, image, is where Potidea is situated. So you can see uh, Potidea from the uh, side of Olynthos. Uh, Xenophon's comment on Olynthian sustainability points towards the factors which supported the choice of the settlement sites. And by the way, I'm sure that you all see that the whole area right now is um, full with olive trees, and olive and uh, people ca still cultivate uh, olives. 
So, uh, what is um, the factors for colonizing uh, this site? First of all, is proximity to the sea for trade facilitation and communication. You saw that yourselves, how close it is uh, to the sea. Natural fortification against inland attacks and para raids from the sea. You saw that Olynthos is built on these two elongated but still very high hills. The third is the existence of fertile and arable land. I think you cannot question that. You just saw that we are in the middle of a 100% rural area. And the fourth factor is proximity to the mines. But this, is, this has more to do with Toroni, not with Olynthos. Of course, abandoned wood from the forest of Halkidiki, the rich resources of the area. I'm sure that you saw uh, the... Um, uh, the mountains uh, the, uh, of Polygyros, which were full with uh, timber and pine woods. Um, so the rich resources of the area and a relatively safe natural base attracted Euboeans and other Greeks from the south to the coast of the peninsula. The new colonies were mostly founded in rural landscapes and were characterized by some very small sites with assam plages consisting of tiles, fine ware, and domestic pottery and occasionally agricultural equipments such as millstones. Now these sites comprised isolated private farms and small villages and rarely shrines dispersed in the countryside, the Hora of the colonies. Immediately after their founding, the colonies were developed into autonomous city-states with common characteristics. And the economy of coastal cities were based on agriculture, fishing and the trade of woods and wine. The trade of wine was developed from a very early period, as implied by the excavation of uh, workshops of trade amphorae at various cities in Khalkidiki. And this suggests that a great area was used for arable cultivation. Fields near to settlements were likely to have been farmed extensively as you just saw on the video. As a coda to the sustainability and uh, environmental subsistence of what came to be known as Halkidi Peninsula, I would like to dwell on some well-known events of 5th century BCE history. The joint defection of Potidaeans, Halkidians and Potidaeans uh, from the First Tilian League marked a milestone towards the forging of an epichoric Halkidic identity. Apart from its economic motives and implications, the defection was an indicative act of common interest and understanding, which resulted into certain sense of solidarity and also uh, a sense of awareness of subsistence. And uh, this is especially important if we consider that the inhabitants, whether natives or settlers, were belonging to a native, whether belonging to a native tribe or being a wandering newcomer, were never thus far organized in a singular integrated state. So, in a way, uh, this sounds more like the first uh, states of the United States which revolted you know, from the British Empire. However, this act did not come as a surprise, but rather as a result of a series of events. Uh, let me remind you that in 437-436 BCE, Athenians founded Amphipolis in Thrace at the lower part of uh, River Strymon, which allowed them to control the land route from west to east across the bridge over Strymon and gave them access to the mining area uh, in Pangaeon uh, Mountains to the much needed for shipbuilding, wood supply and the tar deposits of the surrounding area. The foundation of Amphipolis in Thrace probably accentuated the strenuous turn in the relations between Athens, its northern uh, coastal allies and Sparta because it applied extra pressure on the Chalcidians, whether descendants of the Corinthian colonists that like the Potidaeans or settlers gradually being naturalized like the Botians or, or Halkidians, uh, like the descendants of the mixed Genos of Thracian Sithones and Euboean settlers in Sithonia. 
This pressure was translated into rise in tributes, creation of new tributary cities, and to add insult to injury, the Athenians, as you all know, demanded that Potidaeans pull down the southern part of the city walls, provide hostages, and end their contact with their metropolis, Corinth. The bitterness and agitation caused by these outrageous demands were not left unnoticed by the Macedonian king Perdiccas II, who tried to benefit from the momentum of the Chalcidians' uh, resentment and decided to stir things further up to counterbalance the Athenian interference in the Macedonian internal politics by supporting his enemies. So he put his cunning plan into action by stirring up the major opponents of Athens in Peloponnese, Sparta and Corinth, the metropolis of Potidaea, while in the meantime he convinced the Potidaeans, Halkidians and Botians to, to secede. This resulted to their joint cessation from the Delian Lake well before the Athenian fleet arrived in spring 432 BC to enforce the measures demanded in Potidaea and prevent the neighboring cities from Sicily. According to the Athenian tribute list, all Chalcidian settlements joined the cessation, with the only notable exceptions being the cities of Torone and Sarte. In the aftermath of the cessation, Perticas lured the Chalcidians to vacate their town situated on the coastline to move to Olynthus by offering as leverage to all those who had to leave their homes land to settle on located in Mygdonia, south of the Lake Vove. This leverage was also proposed as protective measure towards an imminent Athenian attack to the cities across the Chalcidic coastline. Some concluding thoughts. And this is a wonderful view again from uh, Olenthos to the uh, area. This is the, the village that you see in the, uh, in the backdrop is the new Olenthos. So the political momentum from Anoikismos of Olenthos triggered the consolidation of a, of a unitary, enlarged collective and more inclusive epicoric identity which substituted the fragmentary and insular identities of the diverse regions and inhabitants of the Chalcidic coastline and hinterland. This is further documented by Thucydides uh, who confirms the existence of the Chalcidic federation and on five occasions he refers to uh, uh, Chalcidically collectively. Uh, on other occasions, his use and meaning of the term remains ambivalent um, without being clear whether it equals the territory of the Chalcidians or the settlements area of uh, Thracian Chalcidians. The degree of integration of different settlements into this newly founded state in the boundaries of, this, uh, of its territories remain unknown. My deliberate use of the phrase federalized Sinoicism is based on Charles' cautionary warning against, and I quote uh, what he says, arguments put forth by some researchers for the existence of a federal state are derived entirely from 4th century conditions, unquote. At any rate, Charles warns against the hierarchies of anachronism I mentioned earlier being imposed on different stages of evolution towards a Chalcidic identity. In that sense, I follow his suggestion, which explains adequately the 5th century pre preliminary stages of the consolidation of a Chalcidic collective Epichoric identity. The choice of Chalcides as a collective name of the newly founded Sinoicism with some historians uh, use as evidence for its federal character points towards a different development less straightforward than being thought of and this is mainly his uh Tarnt, michael Tarnt argument the relocation instigated by Perdiccas and the fear of imminent Athenian attacks across the Chalcidic coastline almost tripled the population of Olympus. Coming back, uh, coming from uh, different ethnic backgrounds and epichoric traditions, the new inhabitants or citizens were, pos were possibly reluctant to blend with the Olympians being a minority. As a result, Halki days were used as an ethnic umbrella term, which laid emphasis on their common origin, which was marked ethnically and geographically.
that term was more easy for all inhabitants to attend. Notwithstanding that not all Thracian Hokkidians had come together in the state, as well as that not all had even seceded from Athens, a tactfully overlooked practicality. The Olynthians had every reason to support this choice as it elevated their status and endorsed their claim of becoming spokesmen for all Chalcidians. However, the fortunes of the newly founded state were about to turn for the worse once more, leading the nascent collective identity into its uh, previous fragmentary, if not insular past, and in an almost moribund state. One of the consequences of the Peace of Nicaea in 421 BC was the restoration of three cities, Mecuberna, Gale, and Singos, which remained under Athenian control. This restoration actually equaled to the cancellation of the 432 BC Anoikismos. In the aftermath of the peace treaty, the Athenians took total control over Semilia and Toroni, now express, expressly named as being their own possessions. The regulations of the Peace of Nicaea forced the Chalcidic cities and settlements to bounce to their status quo ante. This bouncing back had a major implication. The Athenians not only did not acknowledge the Chalcidian state, but also broke it down into its original parts. In essence, with an Athenian garrison in Sarmilia and the restoration of Megberna, Galli and Singos, the whole Scythonia, from which is the central Chalcidic prong, from the northern boundary of Toroni up to the gates of Olynthos, was separated from the Chalcidian state. As a result, it was this reversal to the previous condition that underscored the epichoric and uh, allegedly fragmentary identity of the Chalcidian cities or Chalcidic cities with the Athenian, which Athenians took advantage of so uh, took advantage of so that they forced their former allies to abort their new venture towards forging a collective epichoric identity. So this was uh, my main argument and my presentation um, towards how the Chalcidic identity was forged, especially of Olenthus. And um, I will be happy to discuss more about this if we have time. Hey, this is Bill. Yes, we do. I Thank you. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, I always got a question. So uh, I actually have two. One is uh, the sense of uh, forming their own state mm -hmm. or the reality of forming their own state. How long was the league, shall we call it, was it in, in existence? Um, well, it existed from, well, nominally, nominally, right. uh, they accept that uh, the league uh, was created in 432 BCE. Uh, it was uh, dissolved uh, temporarily in 421, and then it was uh, it resumed and it lasted until the destruction of of, of Olynthos in 349, 348 uh, BC. Uh, the destruction of Olynthos by Philip II marked. Um, the total, the, the end of the Chalcidic Lake, and of course, the end of Olynthus as we know it, because the city uh, lied in ruins until the Americans came in uh, 1924, and uh, Johns Hopkins University came in uh, 1924 and started excavating on this site found Olynthus, excavated it, and um, what you see now is um, uh, the outcome of a new restoration, because again, an American team is working on Olynthus. It's actually a Greek, American, and um, English team working on Olynthus. I think Lisa Nevet from the University of Michigan 
um, is working on this and they still try you know to offer us more information about the household and the houses of Olynthos. What is unique about Olynthos is it is probably the best preserved city built according to the Hippodamian creed. And how do we know that? Because we have the houses, as you see uh, on the slide. Hmm. Okay, so my, my second question is, quite often with these leagues, uh, I'm thinking of Christ Orient League in Caria and uh, the 10 cities, I Ionian cities, there's a foundation myth. There's your, uh, the, uh, the first guy that founded the first city and then his sons founded the other cities. Is there any sort of mythology yeah. just find the lead? Uh, this, is, uh, this is what is unique about the, the Halkidic League because we have a mixed uh, population. This means that we have Botians probably of uh, Cretan or Minoan origins. We have natives. We have people coming there as settlers. Uh, for example, I named Boton, you know, uh, who was uh, in a way the leader of the uh, Minoan expedition. However, I think that in the case uh, of the Halkidic League, it was necessity uh, which uh, imposed the creation of the Chalcidic Lake. And also, um, King Perdiccas of Macedon, uh, because he put forth his cunning plan and he wanted to keep the Athenians away from um, uh, the Chalcidic Peninsula, um, so gave some leverage to the people to come, to move away from the coastline and to move. So uh, we don't have so much information. Uh, I mean, in the case of, of the Halkidic League, we don't have this kind of formation that we usually meet uh, in other uh, cities, like the, the, the Ionian League. Right. Okay, thank you. I see we have a question from uh, someone watching on YouTube. Do ethnic differences of Chalkidian identity translate oops, into um, archaeological finds, something specific um, we do not see in Athenian identity? Um, yes, this is, uh, this is a good uh, question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Greek archaeologist uh, Michalis Tiverios mentions uh, archaeological findings and also Miltiadis Hadjopoulos mentions archaeological findings which points towards uh, a Minoan identity. This means usually pot church. This is what we, what we found. And probably some uh, um, small statues which points towards different uh, epichoric identities that uh, people hear, and also uh, archaeological findings found in tombs, like, for example, the tomb in the Hagios Yanis cemetery. Um, so uh, what do we have to think of Olynthos as a city which had had nothing to do with Athens, although we know that in the fourth, uh, yes, uh, I, I will try to, to explain this earlier. Um, Olympus had no Athenian uh, population whatsoever. The city in Halkidika, which accepted Athenian clerics, was Potidea. And of course, there was also the Athenian colonies in the Halkidic Peninsula. But Olynthos could not be defined as Athenian. Olynthos was the outcome of many people from different ethnic origin coming together. How do we know that? Because 
as I told you, even the literary sources are uh, points towards, you know, this different ethnic background. However, one could say, okay, how, for example, they um, adopted, for example, the Hippodamian Creed. Uh, but I think this is a technological uh, knowledge that was probably widespread. Uh, so this is the, the uh, my answer. Uh, now, the, what was the Hippodamian Creed? The Hippodamian Creed is when you uh, when you divide, you know, the um, where the houses are built between streets and uh, and uh, houses and. In a way, they are they are not built randomly, but they follow a certain pattern. This is the Hippodamian Creed. So, an early city planner. Yes. How to build a city from scratch? Hippodamus yeah. uh, was one of the early city planners. And in uh, Olympus, we can we can see at play right in front of us how his theory of how to build, how to plan a city um, uh, was implemented. Of course, at this point, I should mention also the groundbreaking wo uh, work of Nicholas Cahill, another very important uh, American archaeologist who wrote uh, much about Orinthos. I think also now he, uh, he then he moved on to Sardis because he knows about uh, city planning very well. And uh, I think um, after the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, excavations, I think Nicholas Cahill was, uh, and before Lisa Nevet, Nicholas Cahill was um, one of the most important archaeologists who uh, excavated, investigated Olynthos, and he wrote about the urban city planning of Olynthos. Mm -hmm. So I imagine, maybe you said this, so forgive me if um, I don't remember, but um, so the, the new parts of the city um, that were built for the, the people coming in at the invitation of um, the King of Olynthos, those those parts of Olynthos were built according to the Hippodamian exactly. creed, I imagine. But the older part yes. was more yes. organic, I suppose. What I showed you on the slide, as you rightly mentioned, are, is the new part of the city uh, after the Anoikismos of 432 uh, BCE. Of course, there is another part of what we call the archaic part of the city because the two hills where Olynthos was built uh, was already populated. There were there was another city of the 7th century which was built there. It was inhabited. Olynthos was inhabited very early on. But as you rightly said, this is the new city. Uh, yes, Ian. Uh, well, well. Uh, do the house foundation in, in all of those indicate any any ethnic origins? Uh, no, but I'm sure that the archaeological findings do. However, from what I read from the bibliography, and I think you can uh, read that because everything is available on, on, online. Nicholas Cahill's uh, uh, book is available on, on like uh, I think uh, its title is Household in uh, in Olynthus. Um, it is the little, um, especially what not so much the things that we find in the new city, which might be also the outcome of imports. Uh, from other areas, but also for the the archaic in the archaic part of the city, we find uh, archaeological uh, um, uh, details that point towards different the ethnic origins. Unfortunately, we don't have any inscriptions uh, whatsoever, which uh, points towards a different ethnic identity. But we have small statues which point towards probably. A ritual, a religion um, that people uh, lived there, inhabited the area, and uh, so they they are not of Greek origin. 
Are there any sanctuaries um, that have been uncovered? Um, well, the, I've been asked this before. Uh, sanctuaries, not like in the form that we see, you know, in the Greek cities. Uh, we find certain uh, archaeological findings that they are of religious uh, importance, but not, uh, but, uh, and uh, but not li like in Athens or in Miletus or um, something like that. I saw a hand from Georgia, please. Uh, thank you very much, Maria, for shedding light to a uh, not very, let's say, widely known uh, piece of information. To me, certainly, it gave me um, time to, to think and uh, contemplate. And it's uh, it's a fact, I mean, uh, uh, as you uh, um, kind of uh, indicated uh, subtly, that it's not so evident, it was not in the 20th century, it was not so evident the link between uh, Halkis and Halkidikia's peninsula. And uh, because we don't have any uh, or so rich literary evidence or archaeological mm -hmm. finds even less at the time, it was mm -hmm. not very easy to assume or to, let's say, uh, to found a thesis, um, namely that, you know, the colonization started with the northern Aegean rather with mm -hmm. the west. And it's a quite different story than if you start with that. Um, Actually, what I uh, what fascinated me about your presentation and about the whole uh, story is the fact that Perdiccas, uh, around 432, calls the Boeotians, the Boeotians and the uh, Potidians and the Halkidians of of, of uh, Halkidiki to come to uh, to come together and to rebel against Athens. Mm -hmm. They do, you know, the the Halkidians, which were uh, we care for. They do come together and they leave the, their cities mm -hmm. to go to another city, meaning in a way deforming, destroying, demolishing, parting what was we learned as a, uh, at school, the university, all their lives was there for them the essential part of the life, the oikos, the polis. So in mm -hmm. a way, it's a kind of one of the first moments of um, deliberate alienation or parting from the institution of police to create a federation for mm -hmm. whatever it means, for whatever reasons. And the thing is, uh, it's a momentum which is to be, uh, let's say, considered. Um, and thank you very much for your handouts and all this uh, literary evidence. I think the translation is not as, uh, I mean, as accurate as I would like it to be in, in number two, for example, where mm -hmm. he, uh, the phrase epitrakis halkidoisi, he just translates as the Halkidians. And this is a very important, let's say, differentiation as to later on, as he, he couldn't avoid that, on Oriboya Halkidians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these are, you know, the parameters that in a way by colonized, by being there, mm -hmm. you know, that's, this is a, a story in uh, always the same. By the time they reach and they are settlers, something happens. It doesn't mm -hmm. happen at once, it needs time, but something happens, and there then Epitrakis Halkidoisi. They can go back and help, you know, the compatriots mm -hmm. when it hap when it in need, but something happens and they form a different unity. And this is why to give this even uh, alludes to that, there is to koinoin. Koinoin is something Tokoin. something which is not only the federation, mm -hmm. forming the federation is about a common bond which is for reasons we're not able now to, let's say, uh, understand or, uh, you know, uh, unravel, but it happens and is formed. And this is, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think you pointed out um, uh, many uh, uh, in extremely interesting points. Uh, let me just start by discussing the, just, I think, two of them. First of all, you rightly said that it is still uh, under uh, discussion whether the term Halkidic per se is uh, related to Halkida or to the mines that we still know, you know, the gold mines and so on. We all know what's been going on in, in Halkidiki. Um, 
uh, and uh, the, the the copper mines that were found uh, in in Halkidiki. John Papadopoulos believes that Halkidik and and, uh, and Halkidiki has to do with the copper mines. So he etymologizes the geographical term from the copper Halkos. Um, secondly, you rightly mentioned that we have a unique a case, a unique instance of forming, and uh, uh, this is beyond what we learn at school, of how the koinon, a common identity is formed, probably uh, not through religion or through other, you know, social mechanics, but from different social uh, mechanics, from other, um, through other pathways, so for, for, uh, uh, through and the different uh, social pathways. So it is really interesting, as you rightly, very in, uh, in a unique way, you pointed out that we have people coming together of course, we all know that the Perdikas the second of Macedon didn't do that uh, because he was very good and uh, <laughs> he, he served his own purposes, of course. But people are coming together, are willing, as you rightly said, to change, to, to move from one police to another, of course, because they wanted to protect themselves from imminent Athenian attacks, with, uh, uh, which the, they knew that they were about to happen, especially from the sea. And um, but the interesting thing, and I would like to uh, add to this uh, um, uh, wonderful thought of yours, is that. Some people, although they moved to Olynthos, for example, Potidaeans, some of the Potidaeans moved to Olynthos. But after, you know, the Treaty of Nicaea in 421, when in a way the, the Halkidic uh, uh, Federation was demolished, went back to their city. So in a way they had the social memory, you know, to go back to their polis. To where and also even after 349 BC, we have information that some people were de were uh, self-defined as Olympians, although their polis ceased to exist after the utter destruction by Philip II. So it is very interesting what you pointed out. What kind of social memory these people had? in order to either to preserve this memory or to forge another civic identity by going for, by moving on to another um, area. Uh, so I think that the Halkidic region is generally, if uh, I'm able to sum up what you said, is really understudied. And by the way, is under excavated, that's for sure. Or the if the archaeological finds are not as appreciated as, as, as they should be. Uh, and of course, I'm happy to correct the, um, uh, the translations. By the way, it's from Perseus. Uh, I used it, so I'll be happy to, to correct the, the translations. Because as you pointed as you pointed out, they are not uh, they, they are not uh, giving the full uh, the exact translation. They don't point towards you know the, the nuances and the implications. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Um, this is fascinating. Um, our time is about up, so um, thank you all for coming and watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for having me and for hosting me, Keith. And uh, thank you all the CHS Open House community and the Harvard CHS. <laughs>